So this next session is going to be led by Simon Francis of the Campaign Collective. So I'd like to welcome Simon, if you'd like to put your camera and mic on. Hello. Hi, Simon. How are you doing today? I'm not bad, thanks. How are you? Good, yeah, I'm great, thanks. So just to position this session for everybody, this is, session is going to be looking at the online harms bill and whether it goes far enough. Bit of a spoiler here. Our view is we don't really think it does. So we're also going to be talking about what amendments are needed to make it more effective in reducing online hate and abuse. And hopefully there'll be some questions at the end as well, some time for questions. And Simon will actually lead that Q&A. So I get a little bit of a break during this session, uh, but I'll come right back in at the end. So without further ado, I shall uh, hand the floor to you, Simon. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, and um, yeah, great to, to be here. So my name is um, Simon Francis, and I'm one of the founders of uh, Campaign Collective, and um, we're a social enterprise that helps organisations uh, with their campaigns and, and communications. And um, with our profits, we fund uh, a news website called The Rooftop, um, and it's through that that really we kind of got involved with um, Charities Against Hate because we saw a massive increase in the amount of um, hate speech uh, that we saw online on a what is supposed to be a positive news website and we we still see that um, to this day so all the conversations that have been had so far today are, are really um, useful for us in terms of how we monitor and respond to um, uh, to, to, to kind of be, um, the, the online hate that we that we see um, and uh, and really uh, as part of the work of Charges Against Hate, um, I've been helping to look at the, um, the public affairs and uh, side of, of the work stream um, that's um, been ongoing for the last few years, uh, or the last year or so. And um, uh, through that, obviously, the, the work of the, the online safety bill, which we heard um, a bit about um, uh, earlier on today. Uh, I think before we go into some of the detail, and, and um, uh, we're hopefully going to be joined by Asphal Khan MP, and uh, but just may have just to put you on warning. Uh, I don't think asphal has been able to join us yet, um, so uh, we may come straight to you. Uh, oh no, Asphal has joined us now, so that's uh, great. So we'll do that. But before we get going, um, I just wanted to pitch, uh, pick up on just a piece of terminology that came up um, during um, the kick it out session, uh, um, just so that everyone's aware of what we're talking about. Um, there's something in the online safety bill which talks about legal but harmful content. Um, so this is um, what the, the government might see as being um, um, content that is essentially uh, not breaking any laws, but is still harmful to um, individuals. And in many ways, this will apply to what is also, again, a bit of terminology described as being high volume, but low impact um, hate speech. So that means there's sadly a lot of it, but relatively speaking, it is seen uh, by the government as having low impact on society as a whole. It may have a very big impact, of course, on, on individuals and on specific groups, but it is unlikely to lead to a direct example, perhaps, of terrorism. So that's why it's called high volume, low impact, as opposed to low volume, high impact, um, which may be kind of hate speech that doesn't happen very often online, but could lead to a serious um, criminal offence being committed. So um, without further ado, we'll move straight on to, uh, I'm delighted to welcome um, Asfal um, Khan, um, to MP to um, the Charities Against Hate Live, uh, and Asphal was one of the first, in fact, the first MP um, who agreed to speak with, with us uh, as part of our work and to hear the concerns of um, the people who, um, who our charities work with uh, and about the kind of concerns that they have about their experiences of online harm. So, uh, Asphal, hopefully you can, you can hear me. You may need to unmute yourself. Uh, I have now. I hope you can hear me now. Excellent. Yeah, well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And, and again, thank you for, for being the first MP to meet with Charities Against Hate uh, over, over a year ago. And I think everyone would be really interested to sort of, first of all, hear a bit about your experiences uh, of online hate and perhaps the experiences of your constituents. And then more specifically, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about the online safety bill and, and what you feel about it. <laughs> 
and and how perhaps uh, you feel charities can help you in your work as you call for changes to that bill. Wonderful. Well, can I say how delighted I am to join you today? And thank you very much for asking me to say a few words as well, uh, Simon. So it's a great and very important subject that you're actually dealing with. From my perspective, uh, I have been engaged with a lot of work for many, many decades uh, on hate and division in generally in society. But I also realized in the last few decades and this whole world which is opening up more and more, which is the internet world, the social media. Uh, and there's a whole new area which has been opening up. Uh, like everything else in life, you know, there are things that which are good from what we do, and then there are aspects which can be abused. And I feel this is exactly what is happening on the social media as well, that there is a lot of abuse also takes place. Uh, and whilst it, at the same time, you know, it gives us lots of pleasures as well, being able to connect instantly anywhere in the world and being able to follow things, what's going on as well. So there are many weaknesses in that system, I think. Uh, and I have personally been experiencing things and I know many other people uh, as my constituents who approach me, who also feel the brunt of this negativity which uh, takes place. Uh, thankfully, most of these cases usually uh, remain to the words, but then there are also occasions when it actually gets physical as well. Uh, we recently saw uh, the killing of uh, David Amos, uh, the MP, and five years before that, uh, Joe uh, was one of my colleagues who was also murdered like that. So that there are connections as well from internet world into the real world as well, where people actually physically uh, get attacked. But of course, even just getting it on the internet, that also has an impact. Uh, and one of the areas I, which always concerned me is that myself, I've chosen to be in politics and I can uh, accept a degree uh, of abuse that happens. Uh, but the difficulty also comes with this is my staff haven't chosen to be like that, but they also then get this. Uh, my family hasn't chosen to be, but they also then get this. Uh, so they, they, these are the areas. Uh, and I give you a couple of examples. You know, I have had uh, people been, who have been now been prosecuted, uh, who have been found guilty as well. But example would be, uh, when I became an MP second time around, uh, I thought, well, it'd be lovely to take my oath uh, in English and also in my mother tongue, Urdu. Uh, and I thought that because of my father. Uh, my father had served the British Indian Army. Uh, and I thought, he, you know, up in the heaven, he would love this, uh, myself being in parliament. Uh, and, and then taking the oath uh, in Urdu. So I did oath, you know, the, the, the way it happens is you do English first and then you can also do another oath in a different language. Uh, so I did it and then it was incredible, the abuse I got. First of all, they never understood that actually I had taken it in English as well. Uh, and, and then this was the second uh, part of the oath in Urdu. <laughs> but, but it was hundreds and hundreds of messages, you know, wild messages. And I just thought, whoa, 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 whoa what's your problem with this? Yeah. Uh, and then you also see whenever some of things happen, events happen in the world, then you also see spike uh, people using it. Brexit is a good example. Uh, again, how that was used and how it was used to divide people as well. And once the Brexit took place, again, how it turned into physical people going around now, you know, we've got rid of the European Union, you are next. Uh, so, so you could see this, you know, how this all takes place. Uh, and the final bit, I want to say this before I move on to the safety bill itself is this, uh, I think as leaders, we also have a responsibility. We've seen in the past when leaders uh, try to be a populist leaders, play around with the language and how that also has a knock on effect. And that then also goes onto the platforms uh, as well. Uh, and uh, the good example of this actually is Boris Johnson. He, he made uh, some comments about Muslim women. And then you saw 370% spike uh, uh, attacks against Muslim women. 
uh, unbelievable, you know. Uh, so in that sense, the responsibility on the leadership to not only about the legislation, but I think also in how they use the language as well, because it has a knock-on effect. Now, turning on to the bill itself, the safety bill, uh, fundamentally, I believe that government have been uh, not been robust uh, in against this online abuse. Uh, we've uh, been calling for this for a long time now. Uh, and despite those promises that we had from government uh, from 2017 onwards, uh, we've still uh, really, uh, they've seen that how they've been dragging their feet. And they only promised the white paper was back in April, 2019. And then now they've just about May 21, uh, uh, done given us the draft bill itself. Uh, so this dragging of their feet, you can see in the time scale how, how they've been slow, uh, but the problem itself has actually been getting worse and worse. Um, and, and the second thing I would say is, you know, many other countries around us, they have been getting on with it. Uh, so countries like Australia, France, Germany, and even Singapore, they've all uh, got on with it. They've done the legislation and here we are you know, with the promises of uh, the top and the front line in the world, you know, the best sort of legislation. And yet, you know, we've been dragging their feet. And then when you go in uh, with these little promises uh, that they've been delivering on, uh, I, I would say it's nowhere near the world leading legislation. And, and there are actually problems uh, in the bill itself still, I think. Uh, in, in essence, I would say, the proposed online safety bill and draft only gives social media uh, platforms, I would say, is a free hand. It only asks them to publish their terms and conditions against harmful abuse. Uh, so plat private uh, platforms still mark their own homework. How can that be right? You know, we can't allow this to carry on. Um, they could just uh, publish the terms and do absolutely nothing. So, uh, so we need to then move on further. I think there's another weakness here. This is the tackle of anonymous abuse, uh, which takes place as well. Um, there's nothing against the senior managers, I think. They should be held responsible as well. Um, no action is in updating the communication fences. You know, to, as things, like I said, are moving rapidly in this area, we then need to make sure that our legislations are actually match up. And again, I think that is not happening. So the perpetrators of horrific racist abuse can uh, keep hiding behind these anonymous accounts, exploiting the legal loopholes, uh, uh, and the government in a sense is facilitating this. So how is it that we can actually move better uh, forward? Uh, then I would say there are probably three things I would uh, want to see. So first one I would say is a strong action against the anonymous abuse. Uh, secondly, I would say is a clear requirements for social media platforms and specific liabilities for senior managers to act against online abuse. Uh, and the third point I would say is a strong line against those who carry out the abuse in the first place. No more free hand for the perpetrators and a blind eye to social media companies. We need stronger rights for victims and we need a stronger laws against those abuse and enable this abuse. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for, for those thoughts. I think, you know, echoes a lot of the concerns that the Charities Against Hate group um, and the members have, have kind of told us and, and, and we've been and we've been working on. Um, I, I suppose sort of um, one other area which um, would be interesting to get your, your thoughts on uh, is the proposed role of, of Ofgem as kind of a, a sort of semi-regulator of, of uh, online abuse. And obviously um, the appointment of the chair of, of Ofgem is very much in the news. I, I you know, may as well bring it out in the open. Um, and, and, you know, and that's, a, that's very much a political appointment. And so are, are you concerned about the role of Ofgem and, and then sort of the politicization of, of this, of the, the, the fight against online hate? Well, I, I think at the heart of this is that what we need is a robust systems. And for robust systems, what you need is uh, not a political appointment. So what you need is genuinely independent people who will go after and make sure they enforce the 
the rights and responsibilities which are linked to this role. Uh, and, and of course, I'm deeply concerned with the behavior of the government. And this isn't only one aspect. There's many other aspects of this current government. Uh, I think a lot of people have issues with. Uh, so, so in that sense, you know, I am looking into that aspect as well. I'm hoping to meet up uh, uh, with Ofcom as well, because they do have a role. Uh, and I think that also the companies themselves, you know, they need to understand, we, you know, whilst the government is happy to leave it with them, I, I think they do have a responsibility themselves actually to act. But I think we can't just leave it to the companies. You've got to have independent systems through which there's an enforcement for failure to comply. Because at the moment, I think one of the problem I also find is the whole system is geared we're trying to engage people. So anything controversial uh, and more with the hate and stuff like that as well, it gives them a higher numbers and they just leave it around. Uh, and when they have the ability, the technology to get it down uh, as soon as possible, so the damage is minimized. And so I, I think there's certainly things the companies certainly need to do, but I think we simply cannot leave it to the companies. Uh, you know, there has to be independent enforcement mechanism and they should be independent. I'm going to ask um, Maeve Walsh from the Carnegie Trust um, if, uh, if uh, Maeve has got a question um, that um, she'd like to, to ask um, as your last one, because I know we've only got you for a couple more minutes, but I suppose one last one from, from, from me would be just around um, what, what do you feel about what more can be done in terms of um, covering what, what's being described as legal but harmful content? Um, so this is uh, kind of content that perhaps doesn't break any specific um, law at the moment, um, but is still harmful to individuals who experience it. And, and is there more that can be done in the bill for, for tackling that sort of online abuse? Yeah, I, I, mean, I suppose the tension always is, you know, how do we get this balance right? Uh, I think uh, my, my view is at the moment, this balance is uh, not in favor of the victim. Uh, it's more in favor of the companies. Uh, and then this also brings into the whole lobbying ideas and things as well, you know, which then has influence unfairly on the legislations. So, but look, this is our opportunity to make sure that we have a legislation which is the best in the world. This is an area which is going to be growing, not decreasing. Uh, and, and therefore, it is in everybody's interest that we have those robust legislations uh, with enough flexibility to cope with some of the future ideas which may be developing. So, so I, I think we shouldn't be lagging behind uh, for decades. Uh, and that's the risk that we have currently the way the government is moving forward. Uh, May, May, do you want a final question? Uh, yes, um, and hi Asil, um, nice to meet you. Uh, you mentioned at the, the, the start about the impact that the abuse has had on you as, a, as an MP and indeed the impact it has on your constituents and, and the, the people around you. It feels to me like this is genuinely a cross-party issue, you know, there, there are divisions on, on other aspects of this bill, but the issue of abuse and the impact it has on, on MPs um, and wider society seems to be genuinely cross-party. How do you see that kind of developing now as the, um, as the bill sort of starts its progress to the commons do you think there will be kind of alliances and allegiances around this that will that will help shape the bill in a positive way yeah yeah well i, I have no doubt whatsoever you know that this is a cross-party issue it affects all of us in that sense uh, and i come from a tradition which was i was a member of the european parliament uh, in the european parliament this whole idea of consensus politics is actually much deeper uh, so I, I always welcome uh, bringing people together like that. Uh, and secondly, I, I would say is, you know, there are many groups already in the parliament, like the old party parliamentary groups, APPGs. And this could be another area where more and more sort of co cooperation we need to take forward uh, and, and translate it into our own parties to pull people in the right place. Uh, the common good, the common sense idea, I think generally I have a fundamental belief that most people, irrespective of the spectrum of political pillars that you may have, actually the middle ground is where the, all the strength is, where the majority always is, and, and we should all work towards that. And we've seen uh, when we experience this violence, uh, Joe Cox was a Labour MP, uh, at Davis, uh, Davis uh, Amos, I was a conservative MP, MP. 
So it doesn't uh, separate you politically like that. So similarly for the solutions, why should we be divided like that? We should all come together and we are all there elected as an MP to do precisely that, to represent our constituents. A lot of room for, to do exactly what you're saying. Thank you. Uh, we've, we've, got, we've got time for one quick question um, from from member of the the, uh, the audience today, um, and I think that's just about what can we as individuals do, um, and also what can we as as charities do to lobby our MPs on the online um, safety bill. Yeah, one of the best way of lobbying your MP is as a constituent. You know, you write to your MP, you get a group together, and go and see your MP. And I tell you one thing, uh, if MPs listen to anything else or not, I don't know, but they certainly listen to your constituents. So whoever writes to me, <clears throat> I give priority to that because I know it's these people who have put me in this privileged position. Uh, so the simplest point would be is, you know, to reach out to your MPs, uh, see them, write to them. Uh, and then, of course, there are other things through campaigns and social media and charities like yourself who can also reach out. So if the collective force is brought together like that and um, MPs will feel it uh, and that they will, uh, I would say, uh, react to that and, and uh, listen and uh, make those necessary changes. Well, fantastic. And, 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 you know, hopefully that yeah gives us some um, food for thought as we go into the rest of our sessions today, as we dis you know, discuss what w we can do as, as charities against hate and as, as charities and individuals uh, in, in kind of supporting um, the work of yourself and your colleagues on getting the, the online safety bill um, that we need, um, rather than necessarily perhaps the one we, we have at the moment. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Well, we'll let, we'll let you go now. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us today. Bye bye. Um, so we're going to sort of move on now to uh, uh, Maeve uh, Walsh from um, the Carnegie um, Trust, Tr Carnegie UK. And um, uh, when we met with uh, Margaret Hodge, as Charities Against Hate, um, uh, Margaret was very much of the opinion that we should be looking to uh, work more collaboratively and not to duplicate the work that other organisations was doing. And um, and that was, uh, you know, kind of and on one of the first ports of call that, uh, that Margaret advised to do was to speak to to, to Carnegie, who are doing some um, really important work on on the online safety bill. So, um, I think you've got have you got some slides that you're going to take us through and introduce yourself with. Yes, I have. Let me just see if I can share my screen. Um, uh, okay, can you can you see that? Yeah, this oh. yeah, looks good. Let me go back there then. Uh, okay, great. Um, well, firstly, thank you uh, for inviting me along to, uh, uh, to this event today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Simon said, I'm, I'm from Carnegie UK. Um, I've been an associate with them for the past three years, uh, working with William Perrin and Professor Lorna Woods on the uh, detailed proposals for online harm regulation that have had a certain amount of influence on, on the shape of the, the government's proposals. Uh, although I'll talk uh, a little bit later about where we think uh, they could be improved uh, uh, still more. Um, as well as developing very detailed proposals on the, the idea of a duty of care for online harm reduction, we've um, built alliances and, and, and contacts with um, campaigners across the spectrum on, on online harms, um, from children's charities through to consumer groups, uh, through to, to the various organizations um, who are campaigning to reduce uh, the impact of online abuse on, on particular groups um, in society. So we've got a sort of broad overview of the, the landscape, which again I can talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, later on in terms of where some of those, those campaigns are heading. Um, what I'll do today, um, I know that a number of people on the call probably don't have uh, the sort of detailed knowledge of, of, of the, the bill, so I'll do a bit of a high level explainer as to what it's about and the timescales um, and, and where, where it's heading and then talk a little bit about some of those those areas where it could be improved so um where are we now well the government the think, um government Maeve, if you wanted to hit sorry if you wanted to hit um uh, for, you know kind of script the sort of full screen mode on your presentation just so everyone can see oh that. is that not on sorry it, okay, just it's just it showing the like... kind of the, the next slide and things but yeah if you want ah, to hit that, right great. hold on a sec i can see it on my screen right that's wait a minute let me come out of here then Right. Okay. Oh, yes. So it is. Sorry. I can see it on my screen as a. Let me try again. Can you see that? No. It's. Yep. Yeah, there we are. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. that, that was oh, doing no, it. No, oh, no, <laughs> Let me go back again. Let's have one last go. Does that work? 
just give it a zoom and sometimes takes a minute. No, I, I think it's, it's fine. Like it's, a, it's looking like a full screen on my screen though, so I'm not quite sure why it's not coming through. I think you might be sharing the wrong screen potentially, Maeve. If you um, uh, if you stop oh your share and then Sorry redo it, me. that might work. Don't worry. Right. The beauty Sorry of virtual events. Okay. So let's... <laughs> Uh, yes, indeed. And I, I practiced this earlier as well, uh, but obviously only on my own. So, right, let's have a go at this again. OK, so. If I do. Hold on. Um, uh, shall I just okay. talk through it? Yeah, go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me stop sharing then because that probably is a bit distracting um okay there we go and we can share the slides afterwards that's no problem yes okay so i'll talk you you'll get the same content about the graphics so um anyway the the draft online safety bill was published in may um this year um and uh, as Asa was saying it was a fairly lengthy process of policy development uh, leading up to that the initial proposals actually were published in 2017 and uh, DCMS has uh, in fact gone through six different secretaries of state since then so that gives you an idea as to, uh, to how long this has been uh, in development um the bill's currently undergoing a period of pre-legislative scrutiny um by a parliamentary committee that's comprising members of, of both the house of commons and the house of lords it's chaired by Damien Collins MP, um, who has a very strong track record um, on holding social media companies uh, to account. Um, and the committee is due to report um, by the 10th of December, although it's likely actually that that will be brought forward a, a little bit. So, uh, so their report could be quite imminent. Um, based on the recommendations, then the government will uh, decide on amendments to the bill um, and introduce the full bill into uh, Parliament early next year. So uh, the bill itself uh, is long and it's very complex. Um, so uh, the draft actually runs to over 130 pages and there's a further 120 pages of explanatory notes. So um, a caveat for any of the, the, the material that follows, lots of people are still struggling very much to understand how this is going to work in practice. And that's one of the areas where we think actually some, some work needs to be done to, to simplify it before it's introduced. Um, it's structured, however, as a framework bill, which means that it's introduced Produces an overarching structure for legislation, but a lot of the detail then will be filled in at a later date, either through secondary legislation or codes of practice or guidance to companies. So a lot of that detail as to how it's going to be operationalized um, uh, is a long way down the track. Um, however, whatever its final form, and, and despite uh, the imperfections, it is a significant milestone. Um, Assel's right that other countries are, are beginning to, uh, to pull ahead um, in some areas, but in terms of trying to take Take a, a kind of a holistic approach to reducing harm online. Um, it is a it is a significant um, and, and new development now for, for companies to be accountable to a, a regulator for the actions they're taking to, to reduce that harm. So the draft bill, um, it applies to user generated content um, and regulated com companies are, are split into two categories, um, depending on, on their size, with search services in a, in a third category, um, but broadly required to comply with the same duties. The bill sets out three safety duties um, where companies will be required to take action. Uh, these are on illegal content um, and very specifically um, terrorist content and um, child sexual abuse uh, material. Um, uh, uh, there's a priority areas there. There are separate codes of practice that, that support those two, but it will also then um, cover all the rest of, sort of illegal activity that, that takes place online. Um, they're also required to protect children's online safety, um, so to do risk assessments in terms of, of whether children are accessing their services in the first place and then ensuring that, uh, that those, the, the children have greater protections than, than adults. Um, and then the third area, which has been mentioned already, um, is a duty to protect adults. Um, so this covers the, the so-called legal but harmful um, material. Um, and as Afsal was saying, um, it's a very weak duty, this one. Um, not only does it only apply to the larger companies and not to all, all the companies within the scope of the regime, um, but they are only required to um, uh, ensure that their terms of services service sets out how they propose to deal with this content. Um, and there's no kind of further accountability beyond that and indeed no standardization of, of, of what those terms of service should look like. 
Um, there are also three counterbalancing um, uh, obligations on, um, on companies um, to have regard, first of all, for protection of free speech and privacy. Um, and this is where there is obviously quite a lot of tension then between reducing online abuse and obviously protecting people's uh, right for free speech online. Um, protection of content of democratic importance, again, another area where there's, there's indeed a tension between the way people um, interact online and, and, and the democratic process, particularly with regards to um, uh, targeting elected representat representatives or, or looking at kind of the electoral process. And the third area, the third protection is for journalistic content, which is effectively a carve out for, for, for press and, and news websites. Um, so in terms of how this is going to work, um, at a high level, um, the Secretary of State is going to have to, uh, to designate priority harms. Um, we believe this needs to be done sooner rather than later for, for companies to be able to, uh, uh, to start to prepare. Um, Ofcom will have to do a market risk assessment to uh, inform the guidance that they're going to give to service providers on, on how to comply with the regime. And then armed with that risk assessment, providers themselves will then risk assess their own services um, to, to ensure that they can then comply and can prove to Ofcom that they, that they are complying. Um, Ofcom will be responsible for producing a raft of codes of practice to help companies in this sort of area. Um, and then the services, once the regime's operational, will we'll need to provide annual transparency reports. But again, these, these probably don't go far enough to provide true accountability for, for what's really going on on the platforms. Um, Ofcom's enforcement powers are, are relatively good and um, they've got very good inf information gathering powers and can impose fines. Um, Afsal also mentioned about the, uh, the criminal liability. There is a provision in the bill for uh, criminal sanctions to be brought in at a later date. Uh, the bill suggests two years, but the Secretary of State at uh, her recent uh, committee appearance did suggest that that might be brought forward um, and was very much of the view that companies know what they need to do already under this regime. So, so why wait then to, to bring in those, uh, those stronger sanctions? So particularly for the children's charities who are quite concerned about, um, about the, the, the seriousness that companies will take this. That, that's quite an important um, area where they're, where they're pressing for, for, for clarity. Um, in terms of the timing um, of the, the bill and the legislation, um, much depends on how soon the government um, responds to the Joint Committee's report and its recommendations. We are assuming that a final bill um, will be introduced into the, into the House of Parliament uh, by Easter next year. It may be earlier. Uh, depending on, on how extensive the, the amendments are going to be. It'll be introduced into the Lords first, which is the, uh, the usual approach with, um, uh, with bills that relate to communications uh, matters. Um, and we would assume then that the bill would receive royal assent by the end of next year. But there's probably going to be at least another year then uh, in terms of bringing forward the secondary legislation and the codes of practice for, for the regime to be, be fully operational. Um, I'll come on to then just a, a few points in terms of, of, of where um, there are challenges with the bill and, and, and where certainly at Carnegie we feel more needs to be done. Um, and these also are, are borne out by a lot of the evidence and testimony that, that the committee has heard. Um, this includes its, com its complexity, um, the scale of the powers that the bill gives to the Secretary of State at the moment and its scope. Uh, so taken together, that's kind of all of it, um, but, uh, but I'll, I'll come through them, uh, through, go through them in, in, in uh, uh, in summary now. Um, the problem with the complexity, as, as I described um, earlier, there are those three safety duties and three then protections um, uh, designed into the bill. We're very much of the view that uh, the, the bill needs to kind of go a level up and introduce um, an overarching um, uh, duty of care that would be much more similar to the kinds of duties that you see in other regulated um, industries, where the social media platforms are required to effectively risk assess their systems properly and to take measures to reduce the risk of reasonably foreseeable harm. That then provides a focus on outcomes. It, it focuses on how the, the platforms and the services are designed and how those design factors are the risk hazard rather than necessarily the individual bits of content um, that, uh, that then are designated as, as harmful in themselves. So we last week um, produced a, uh, a, a significant kind of uh, detailed paper setting out a number of amendments that would in introduce um, what we're calling a foundational duty of care, along with a revised version of the draft bill. Um, I'm not expecting everybody would want to read all of that, but we do have a blog that describes it, so I can share the link to that uh, um, at the end of, end of this talk. 
Um, the second area, the powers it gives the Secretary of State to direct Ofcom, um, again, in the conversation with Simon and Assel just there, this is a very politically contentious issue, uh, not least in, in respect to the, the appointment of the, the chair of Ofcom, which is, is, is ongoing at the same time. Um, the bill gives far too many far reaching powers in our view and in view of lots of people to the Secretary of State, um, which threatens the independence of the regulator and, and is kind of out of kilter with international norms um, on, on uh, communications regulation. Um, so we're very much the view that those powers need to be removed and, and Ofcom's independence needs to be, needs to be assured. We've written quite a lot on, on that too, which I'm happy to share. Um, and then the third area, it's scope. Um, I mean, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a paradox that, you know, despite the complexity of the bill uh, and the size of it, uh, many feel that its scope doesn't go far enough. Um, and uh, there are lots of areas of harm that aren't included or indeed are deliberately excluded. Uh, one area where there's a lot of campaigning going on at the moment um, is around fraud and scams where paid for advertising has been explicitly written out of the, uh, the regime. Another area is societal harms. Um, so societal harms can emanate from all sorts of areas. It can be the aggregation of online abuse and online hate. So not just obviously that the hate that is uh, directed at individuals or, or uh, people in public life, but how that then kind of aggregates to provide um, uh, a certain uh, significant le level of kind of abuse and aggravation to whole communities. So how do you address that sort of uh, issue if you're very much focused on, on individual pieces of content rather than, rather than the overall impact? It also applies to things like misinformation and disinformation, where again, um, specific user targeted, um, uh, uh, misinformation that's targeted at the individual is included, uh, but um, the, the broader societal harms, for instance, of interference in the de democratic or electoral process um, aren't included. So there are areas there that we feel need to be, uh, need to be addressed. Um, there will be a swathe of new um, uh, harms that will come in um, under the illegal uh, content category um, as a result of the recent Law Commission's um, uh, reviews. There's been a review on the communications offences that the Secretary of State has indicated will be included. Um, the re recommendations are very likely to be included in the bill. Um, there's also a review from the Law Commission due shortly on um, hate crime. And while the uh, timing of that probably um, means that it won't be included in the, in the bill itself by assuming that the government um, accepts a number of those recommendations, those then will be then included in that kind of bucket of, of, of illegal content. Um, and, uh, and finally, the, um, the debate around online abuse, obviously, um, uh, again, Astel mentioned the, the death of uh, David Amos and how that has, has um, focused minds um, in terms of the, the, the abuse and hatred that, that public figures uh, receive. Obviously, the abuse that the Black England footballers got at the end of the Euros was another point where there was quite a high profile debate um, on that. At the moment, um, as we say, the, the legal but harmful uh, provisions probably don't go far enough to address that. Um, but we very much think that with the development of the, the single duty that we're proposing, you would actually be able to, to kind of take a much more extensive and uh, systemic approach at, at dealing with that um, uh, in future. Um, so I'll stop there. I think I've probably overrun a little bit uh, too, but I'm very happy to take questions and indeed to share uh, further links or, or indeed put people um, on this, uh, uh, this call in touch with others who are campaigning in particular areas, if that would be helpful too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and it really has been incredibly helpful being part of the, you know, getting the updates from um, Kanigi on on uh, the kind of the work that, that you and, and your colleagues are, are doing. Um, I, I think, yeah, a couple of questions that you, you managed to answer without even knowing it, uh, which is always a good start um, for uh, a contribution. Um, but yeah, a couple of, of questions that come in. So uh, I suppose, yeah, if you wanted to just sort of say a little bit more about the timings, because I think uh, we obviously there's a kind of a period where I suppose we are going to need to sort of help you and others in terms of the influencing of the bill and the content of it uh, and so how do we kind of get involved in that and then secondly uh, after um, it has been passed um, how do we get involved in ensuring that the bill is enforced and uh, and kind of what can we do sort of longer term 
Uh, yeah, so in terms of the kind of the short term um, uh, timescales, the uh, the Joint Committee is, is writing its report at the moment. So, so certainly if there are um, ways into uh, MPs or, or peers are on that committee or, or, or others who are who have their ear, then there's still time to, I think, influence their report. Um, the government, uh, we're assuming that the government will respond to that report fairly quickly and may even be before the end of the year. And there may be a debate in Parliament before the end of the year, in fact, on, on the committee's recommendations. But the final bill won't be introduced until uh, until kind of Easter well we think probably sort of uh, before Easter next year then um, as with all um, legislative processes the, the period that it's in uh, in Parliament, uh, there will be uh, rafts of amendments so I think again using the um, who you may already have uh, connections with and, and allegiances with will be will be vital um, in that uh, in that period. Um, I think then once the bill has received royal assent, um, it will be interesting to see how civil society I think is brought into this in terms of, of providing ongoing challenge and accountability and, and, and being a sounding board. Uh, certainly, Ofcom has a track record of doing that in in other areas. Um, I think it probably we could set up a number of different routes to bring in civil society, both to the, the research that it will need to do uh, to um, inform its codes of practice, but also in terms of providing that ongoing um, accountability and scrutiny. Uh, one of the proposals that the Secretary of State also appears to have accepted is, is for an ongoing parliamentary committee to, to provide scrutiny of the regime once it's, um, it's operational. Uh, so that also will be, um, I think, a much more transparent and indeed robust process to ensure that the debate as to whether it's working and indeed whether uh, social media uh, companies are, are, are being held uh, to their promises um, uh, is out in the open and, 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 and much, more, uh, much more transparent. Um, so just uh, a couple of final questions, which we may have to take offline just because they're announced separately, just because they're sort of slightly um, kind of um, a sort of tangent to, I suppose, to the online um, hate side of things which we're focusing on today um, but just around uh, and we're also slightly running over but um, just around um, in the the bill was given as a reason for um, uh, not implementing part three of the digital economy act uh, regarding age ver verification for commercial porn sites what extent does the bill deal with that I suppose there is a wider question here about the verification of users which perhaps we need to kind of we can to talk about here uh, and I think there's also then a second question just around if fraud and scams are included how to ensure Ofcom is not overwhelmed um, but consumers receive the protection and assistance they require and I think that's sort of probably a general point as well about you know Ofcom's resources and that was certainly something that we felt and indeed the police's resources was something that came up when we talked to the Metropolitan Police and to, um, uh, to kind of the London Assembly about this issue was that was something that came up in terms of um, resourcing for the enforcement. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on those two areas and then we'll probably have to wrap up I'm afraid. That's right. No, briefly on the um, uh, Digital Economy Act and 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 the provisions that have been dropped there. There is a yeah, there is there is a, a very significant campaign going on um, at the moment um, uh, to ensure that the protections in the online safety bill at least replicate what was intended to be there. And it looks like the government probably are going to concede on that. So the, the latest uh, kind of ministerial statements suggest that uh, that the, those provisions will be will be updated. Um, you're right about the age verification aspect of it. This is quite Quite, um, controversial as well in its own right in terms of, of, of how, how far that then becomes verify, verify, verifying the identity of everybody who's online. Um, Baroness Kidron um, is introducing a private members bill next week, uh, oh no, at the end of this week actually, in the Lords, which is an attempt to introduce a set of standards for, for age assurance and age verification online, which regardless of, of what happens to the online safety bill will, will, will be an important kind of uh, forum for, for those debates on the practical approaches that, that might work there. Um, and on the fraud and scams bit, um, yes, I mean, this is this is the thing that, that there are huge campaigns and huge numbers of amendments that could be made to this. I think we're of the, the view that if you simplify the way that the bill works in the first instance, then it can actually support a 
broader scope because what you're asking companies to do is much more uh, focuses on systems and processes on, on annual risk assessment rather than looking at buckets of content that then have to you know the, the, the processes have to be replicated across all of those areas of content. The other aspect that's quite um, positive at the moment is that Ofcom uh, is now in a, a formal mechanism with other regulators so dig the digital regulation cooperation forum uh, which while informal at the moment is a means by which those regulators can keep in touch and cooperate and we're very much of the view that the things that are, are, are the responsibility of particular regulators should stay in their, their jurisdiction but you you work in mechanisms by which that cooperation with Ofcom can can work so that Ofcom can then take action in relation to the companies that they're, they're overseeing so it is possible but it, it, it requires a slightly different design I think to the legislative um, uh, process that we've got at the moment. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, I think Jonathan's put his camera on, which is a definite sign that uh, I should, uh, we should stop talking for the time being. Um, so, but thank you very much, Maeve, and, and obviously to Asgol when he was around as well. Is it okay, Maeve, if I share your Twitter account? Because I find that very useful in terms of keeping on top of what's going on. Please do. I've put, a, I've put a link into our website as well. And uh, on our website, there's a link then to sign up to our fortnightly newsletter too, which uh, is, is quite a good way to keep in touch with the parliamentary developments. And even if you're not in the weeds on all of this, it's, it's quite a good summary of, of where we are. But thanks very much for having me. Thanks a lot, Simon. Thank, thank you for coming. Jonathan. Thank you very much, Simon, for leading that session overall. And thanks to Maeve and Axel very much for their contributions as well. I thought that was a really interesting exploration of some really key legislation and some takeaway actions for all of us, which uh, I'm certainly going to do mine and contact my MP and encourage them to lend their support in the appropriate way.